people like you can turn on your camera if you want you can turn on your microphone if you want um i'll enable the q and a um so you can either ask questions in the q and a during the presentations and then i can read them out after um or if we have time you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly um so with that i stop sharing now and now tabata should be able to share good i need to make sure that this is going to work well let me put all of you to the side Yes, nice. Can everyone see it? Yes. I think so. Great. I'll just make it slightly bigger. Screen. There you go. Nice. So welcome to my um, intro to style guides. So first disclaimer, this is a shortened version of one of my mini workshops that I launched last week. Um, so if you're interested, you can get in touch later uh, and then you're going to get a much bigger, more complete version. But this is just a little teaser. Um, I do call that a displace. This is the other disclaimer uh, as an umbrella term for any kind of visualization. So whenever I say data displays, I'm meaning dashboards, reports, data stories, infographics, whatnot, you, you name it. We have too many names to mean ways of displaying data. So that's just the overall term that I use. Um, cool. A little bit about me, if you don't know hey, who sorry, I am. Sorry, Tabata, we can't see your lovely face anymore. Sorry? Face anymore. Your video has stopped. Has it? I'm still yes. sharing the video, though. Um, can you see me now? No? no? It's just black. Just black. Funny. I can see myself. <laughs> <What's happening? laughs> hmm. I'll like, turn it on. It doesn't and... affect your screen though, so I still think yeah. you're fine. Yeah, I think yeah, probably. Okay. Well, let's okay. Just go yeah. on then. Let's just carry on like that. Yeah. Don't know why it turned black, but yeah. Well, you'll just have to hear me. <laughs> Anyway, but um, thanks for letting me know that. And um, so if you don't know about me yet, uh, my name is Tabata. I'm also known on social media as T from Data Rocks, sometimes just Data Rocks. Uh, you might have seen me hanging around on LinkedIn or Blue Sky. Um, I do run a few online things. So I post a lot on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter called Design Matters, if you want to subscribe to that, where I talk more about that display is about how to display data nicely, why design matters for your dashboard design. Um, I'm also the person behind the data viz bookshelf and the data design manifesto. If you've seen that around, that's me. And if you want to connect, just, just go to my website. You can see all the links where you can talk to me about there. Good. So we're going to talk about style guides today. Uh, and usually when we start talking about this type of thing, we start with the definition. But what I like to do instead, because I know that everybody kind of has a version of what they think a style guide is, um, I'd rather go with what isn't a data viz style guide. Because um, there's a lot of misconceptions. And I'll just talk about one of them that I think is the biggest one here. A, a data viz style guide is not a brand guideline. Um, I know that a lot of style guides start as brand guidelines or data visa style guides can be incorporated into brand guidelines, but the two get confused a lot. And the result of getting that confused usually uh, is that you neither have a brand guideline that considers data visa specific things, nor you have a data visa style guide that really considers brand specific things because those two documents, although they overlap, they are very different in essence. So you end up with a dashboard that you know uses all the right color palettes, uses the right um, icons, uses the right typography, but ends up looking like this, something like that. It's not looking bad, but it could be much better or it's just very jarring, very confusing. Um, there's not consistent use of color or there's not consistent use of typography. It's all over the place, there's backgrounds. Often it comes from a template um, and the template doesn't quite fit what you're trying to do with your data display. So brand guidelines are a useful starting point, but they are not the same as data visa style guides. 
Um, and the reason for that is, well, there's three big reasons. The audience, the context, and the purpose of brand guidelines are different from those of a style guide. Um, the audience for your brand guidelines is usually external customers, investors, partners, employees. Um, the context is printed materials, official communications, media, and the purpose of that is just basically brand recognition, is making sure that your brand is consistently um, shown in, in, in a, a bunch of different mediums in a bunch of different ways. Um, sometimes you also want to create uh, an emotional connection with the brand um, and create trust and loyalty and make sure that people know that that brand is that brand and what it stands for. Um, data visa style guides have its own particular set of things. But brand guidelines also talk about brand elements, which are your color palettes, your typography, your icons, and your other visual elements like illustrations and things like that. And that's where they overlap. But data visa style guides have to be much more prescriptive than brand guidelines are. They have to talk about extended color palettes. You cannot just have a primary, secondary, and an accent color like most brand guidelines have. You have uh, categorical color palettes, you have diverging color palettes, you have sequential color palettes, you have to prescribe where to use each one of them, are they accessible? Uh, and all of those things are not always considered as part of brand guidelines. So I would say that data visa style guides are much broader in scope, even though they overlap in that tiny little bit with uh, brand elements from brand guidelines. Both of them have their own purpose, their own audience, their own context but they are different. And this is a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and it is the starting point for any time you want to develop your own style guide. So instead of just jumping into grabbing everything from your brand guidelines and putting it into a dashboard without being quite sure if that works or not, there's a lot of small considerations and big considerations you have to take before. Um, cool. First thing, why do we need a data visa style guide in the first place? Can't we just do it? Can't we just use the default? Well, yes and no, um, often no. Um, you may be spending hours and hours formatting details. Um, you may be just every time you have to develop a, a data display of any kind. Um, you may be spending a lot of time thinking about color, thinking about typography, thinking about where to place things. Is this an ideal layout? How does this work? All of those little decisions make design really hard, especially if you're not from a design background. Uh, they don't come naturally. You have to make those decisions every time. Uh, it, it, is, it is very overwhelming. Uh, and it also results in lack of consistency across your data displays. You may make a certain decision for the sizes of your fonts on one dashboard, and then on the next dashboard, you change everything up. And that is confusing for whoever is receiving your dashboard. So suppose you have a sales manager, she receives five dashboards from your team. Each one of them uses colors for different reasons. In one of them, you have a traffic light system. It's reds and greens and yellows. And in the other one, you just decided that reds, greens, and yellows were not good enough, so you're doing a purple to orange diverging palette instead. Um, the person is left with a question like, do these things mean the same thing? Should, well, why am I using orange now and red in a different place? Um, so it is, it is very confusing if you're not consistent uh, of your data displays or the use of your elements in your data displays. Um, and that leads to low adoption. So a lot of people tend to think that um, design is secondary or that form follows function. And I like to think of it as being form and function need to be side by side from the very get go. Um, the best data visualizations you can think of probably excel at both things, both form and function. And design is very well taken care of. Um, adoption, you have to think that when somebody's using a dashboard or somebody's seeing a data story or seeing a presentation, they are just seeing the end result that you're presenting to them. They're not seeing all the work that went before that. So uh, if you're seeing, if you're struggling with uh, trust in your data displays or with adoption in your data displays, that first contact that your end users have with something um, is very valuable. And it's not about looking good, it's about looking polished, professional, and looking like care was put into it. And that 
helps a lot with trust as well. Um, sometimes we just struggle to articulate or to just find the design decisions that we made. Sometimes we chose a certain shade of blue and then we go to a feedback session and the feedback you receive is, but I don't like that shade of blue. Um, a style guide is quite useful for establishing those things before you start developing. Uh, and that's a, creating a common language with your users as well. So the users already know what to expect visual wise, um, and the discussions can go towards more productive discussions instead of just the looks of things. Um, lack of common visual language is something that I always talk about. Um, I consider that a visualization as a way of communicating data. And it is a language. Um, if you can standardize it as much as possible or make it as common as possible with everybody that's reading your message, that makes it more efficient, that makes it more effective. People already know that that shade of red or that shade of blue or that that size of font or that icon or that illustration means something. And they don't need to think about it more than once. Uh, they learn and then it's reproducible. So those are all good reasons to have a style guide. And those are ways how it can help you. Um, as I said, that is a language. Uh, style guides help teams create and establish a common design vocabulary with everybody that's developing and using it. Cool. First point that I mentioned there, I mentioned audience, context, and purpose. First point is your audience. So your audience is who will use your style guide. And this is a tricky one, because every time I go into a project to help somebody develop a style guide, the perception is just that the style guide um, will fit in between the person developing and the development. So yeah, there it is, your style guide there. Um, that's not quite always true. A lot of the time you have a developer or you have a team that's developing things. They develop a style guide, but that style guide ends up being used by other people other than just whoever developed it. Um, you have to think of a style guide as a product designed to help other people design other data products. So it's kind of an intermediate step and the audience is twofold. You have your end audience who's gonna receive the result of the things that were done with your style guide. Those are, for example, your managers or, or um, your, your directors or the people reading your data story or using your dashboards. Um, but you also have an intermediate group that's often forgotten about. Not just developers do data viz in a company. Sometimes you have somebody from sales or somebody from marketing or somebody who's never used design before from operations and they have to do a presentation or they have to do a, a, a report for a higher up. Um, they have to run a monthly pack for their directors. And those people are also creating visualizations they might not be creating them on Tableau desktop or on your data visualization tool of choice, but they are also creating it. And they could benefit immensely from having a style guide that's directed to help them as well. Um, so think about the fact that whenever you're making decisions about your style guide, you're not just deciding it for your final audience, the people who are using the final product you're creating with it, um, you also have to think about whoever is going to use the actual style guide. Who is your style guide's audience? Cool. Usually, that audience is split into two groups. I call them developers and communicators. Developers are the people who are very tech savvy. Um, you normally work with analytics. You know your your SQL. You know your Python's. Um, so you're very you're very um, comfortable with using code snippets or having replicable components, standardized processes. And often developers prefer full flexibility of their style guides. They want rules to a certain extent, but they want them to enable creativity and enable um, other things to be done with it. So not as constrained. But on the other side, you have also what I call the communicators. So those are the people who rely on spreadsheets and slides. They have ad hoc requirements. Analytics is not their day job. They do analytics as part of another function. So they tend to prefer quick how-to guides. They tend to prefer do's and don'ts. Just give me examples. Give me basic good practices, templates that I can just plop into my slides and make it work um, so that I don't have to think about all of those little things. because. But, you know, that's just a small part of what they do. Um, those audiences are 
quite different and knowing where your your mix of people using your style guide falls into um, is one of the first steps to know how your style guide will be uh, will it be more about um, having styles having uh, um, code snippets having patterns pre-established in in your tool of choice or will it be more about having um, how-to guides or having a PDF file or having something that's more easily accessible for everybody else to use? Um, so pro tip, this is if you're trying to do your own style guide, the very first thing you should do is to serve your data views landscape. Learn about everybody who's producing data views. Um, how do they make it? when do they use data viz and when do they have to create it who is consuming the data viz that these people are creating and when do they need to do that like is it because of a meeting is it monthly is it weekly is it daily is it ad hoc um understanding those patterns will help you be more effective in creating your style guide and will also ensure adoption um another thing is i spoke about brand guidelines make sure you know if they exist who created them and if you have an in-house design team go talk to them um don't just go making a second version of it as your own brand guidelines just go and talk to them uh, often uh, the brand guidelines were made um thinking just about brand but not thinking about other uses and they just haven't even considered it so it, it you can talk to your designers as well and ask them for help um, in case their brand guidelines is kind of insufficient. Um, so yeah, just make sure you understand everybody who's involved in this and talk to people. Cool. Second thing is to think about context. So where and when will your data, um, data visit style guide be used by the people you just learned about? Um, this is the style guides context, not just the final visualizations context. So again, there's a twofold problem here, but mostly thinking about when the style guide is called upon. Um, is it when somebody is starting to develop a project? Is it because there is a meeting and you need to quickly make a, make, make a little chart to put on a slide? Um, that's the type of context that I'm talking about. Knowing your context is important because um, it will define where your style guide will live, and it will define in what format it will be made available. So if you have a developer's um, type of audience and they use it as part of their development cycle, it's very probable that putting your style guide on a GitHub is, is enough. But if your audience is made of communicators and they're not familiar with that technology, never heard of GitHub before, maybe you need to do a, a website or a PDF file to make it accessible for them as well. And that defines the format and where your style guide will live. Um, context also comes into when people will need to create data viz, the location where they'll be creating data viz. And by that, I mean, uh, will it be on desktop? Will it be on laptop? Um, do they create data viz mobile? Um, um, how, how will they have, which technologies do they have in front of them to do that? And also with skill sets and tools. So again, if it's a developer, they will know how to deal with coding, they will know how to deal with complex styles. But, they, but then again, if you have Sally from sales, she will probably be overwhelmed by all of that, just not use it because all she wants is a template to put on a slide. Um, so okay, understanding all of that will, um, help you um, define your perfect context for your for your style guide. And another pro tip, um, make feedback easy and review frequently. So, okay, you establish that you have a group of people or two groups of people that use your style guides um, and you established a few elements, uh, make sure people can easily go back to you and say, no, nah, this is not working for me. And here are the reasons why. And make sure you're reviewing and iterating that style guide frequently based on the audience and context you have. Cool. Last thing, um, purpose. And purpose is not just the reasons why. Purpose talks more about what kinds of problems we're solving with a style guide. And having a very good problem statement in the beginning of your style guide journey can help you a lot to be on track and to scale more easily later. So why? what are the reasons why you're creating this style guide? 
Um, usually, um, the reasons I see are in three big groups. First one is consistency, so that it, 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 it is established system of what good data views looks and feels like, um, so that it is consistent across different data displays. Uh, the other thing is cohesion, which means if it looks and behaves the same way, uh, it must come from the same place and it must mean the same thing. We talked a little bit about this before. And the third one is intentionality. So make sure that the design choices matter and that they were tested and predefined before you put them in the, in the style guide so that people can trust that those decisions will always work depending on their context and depending on um, who's using them. Last but not least, a good data viz style guide establishes better design defaults. That's the main purpose uh, for me. You want to raise the bar of your defaults um, and you want to lower the entry barrier for non-designers. Uh, you want to make sure that somebody doesn't need to learn everything that there is about design just to make a good design. Um, they can grab your style guide, follow it and make sure that things look polished, professional and accessible enough. Um, so those are basically the big purposes uh, why style guides can help you. Cool. Having said all of that, there's um, the matter of how. Okay, so great. I know my audience. I know the purpose why I'm doing this. Yes, I, I'm behind all of that. I know the context where people are going to use it. How do I even start developing a style guide? So there's this theory. Uh, which is uh, very widely known in web design called atomic design. Uh, it's been around for about 15 years and the basics of it are very well represented in this picture. You will have a bunch of little pieces, they're sort of disorganized, but they all kind of look like they belong together. So you have a clear color palette, you have a clear group of components and little blocks, like your little blocks of Legos there. Uh, you organize them in a way where they are easily um, recognizable and easy, easily accessible as components. And with them, you can then create anything that you need within those parameters, within those choices. So in the case of the picture here, you can make a truck, you can make a car, a racing car. They are all different things, but they all look like they belong together. They all look like they're part of the same system. They all look like a family. Um, and this is what you're looking for with your style guide. You want to create small building blocks that can be combined and recombined to form something else, but that something else will always be consistent regardless of what it is. Um, so big thing, consistency, but not sameness. Um, I like the approach of style guides better than I like the approach of having strict templates because you create building blocks that can be recombined to create whatever you need. It doesn't stiff um, creativity as much because you need that flexibility to create that visualization. So it, it's always kind of a balance between being consistent, but not always looking the same or not, or not constraining things too much. They belong at the same family, but they're not exactly the same thing. And then last tip, start small and scale slowly. Think first about your building blocks, combine and recombine them. Make sure that those combinations work. If they don't, ditch them. If they do, double down and go scaling over time. Um, the style design guides, um, as much as design systems, they are systems. So it means they will evolve over time uh, with iterations and with you learning more about what works and what doesn't, uh, with the people who are involved in it, using it more, it will evolve and it will change. And that's OK. And that's a great thing. So don't think that you're going to quickly put a bunch of things together for a style guide. You're going to um, publish it. People are going to use it. And that's the end of it. Um, you usually have a lot to think about after that first launch as well. So iterate and keep on going. Just a recap. Define who you will use your style guide, in what context, that's when, where, and how. Um, where it will live, in what formats it will be available, have a very clear purpose. The best way to do it is to have a problem statement. Um, start defining your decisions um, with an atomic design framework. That's define your small building blocks first, and then test things out and iterate as much as needed so that you can scale and evolve from there. That's it. That's the introduction to style guides. 
So you can go from this um, to probably that, which is using the same typography and the same colors, but it's very different. Um, and it is way more purple, purposeful and way more consistent as well. Cool. Open for questions. Sweet. Thank you. Um, are, are there any, maybe we have time for one question if somebody has a, a quick one? Hello. No questions. Okay, cool. If you do have any other questions, feel free I, to put them in the chat. Is, if Alex is talking, I can hear him. Hello, hello. Oh. I can okay. hear now. Great. Okay. It was me. <laughs> okay, cool. um, so if anybody else has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Tabata, you, you stick around for the next half an hour anyway? Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, sweet. Then with that, I hand straight over to Kat to uh, take us through her presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Share my screen with you. Hopefully you can all see that okay. Yep, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, to give you just a bit of an idea about my background, I work as a data storyteller, which basically means that I use a story structure to communicate the meaning of data. Uh, in 2016, I set up Rogue Penguin, a data storytelling company based in Te Whanganui Atara, or Wellington. I work closely with many government agencies and some of our larger corporates to teach them how to tell their data stories. In December last year, I published the Data Storytellers Handbook, which details my data storytelling process. Uh, and I also cover this in the workshops that I offer. But today, I thought I'd do something a little different for my talk. I thought I'd tell you a data story and then pick it apart and show you what it's made from. That way you can see an example of data storytelling and also gain some insight into the process involved. So the data story I'm going to share is based on or inspired by a more personal story. In 2019, uh, my mum was diagnosed with bowel cancer. She was 65 years old. She had no symptoms. The cancer was picked up due to New Zealand's bowel screening program. And after her diagnosis, she had an operation to remove part of her bowel. And this was followed up with several rounds of preventative chemotherapy. She's now doing great. But the year after her treatment, so in 2020, I remember thinking how grateful I was that this had all happened to her the year before before COVID-19. So I thought I'd tell you a data story about bowel cancer in New Zealand. I'll explain how COVID-19 impacted our screening program and then look at how this disease might impact our future health system. Over 3,000 Kiwis are diagnosed with bowel cancer each year. It's our third most prevalent form of cancer. New Zealand has a bowel screening program. Anyone between the ages of 60 and 74 is eligible to participate. A free screening kit is sent to your house. If the result flags anything of concern, the next step is to have a colonoscopy, which is the primary way to diagnose bowel cancer. Unfortunately, in March 2020, COVID-19 lockdowns uh, caused many of our non-acute cancer services to be postponed, including colonoscopy delivery. And this sparked fears that it would lead to people presenting with a more advanced stage of cancer when they were diagnosed. In the months following lockdown, our health sector worked really hard to catch up on delayed diagnostic procedures. And as a result, the number of bowel cancer registrations in 2020 was in line with 2019 levels. Now, if the rate had dropped, it wouldn't have been because there were fewer people with bowel cancer. It would have been because there were fewer people able to be, be diagnosed. And so maintaining that rate reflects New Zealand's efforts to 
mitigate the impact of the pandemic on our healthcare services. But was it enough to match 2019's rate? Were we capturing all bowel cancer cases in 2019? Due to set screening ages, the answer is likely no. And like any screening program, it tries to balance the risk of someone developing the disease with the resources available to operate the screening program. So potentially, some cases of bowel cancer have gone undiagnosed and not necessarily due to the pandemic. Over 90% of bowel cancers are diagnosed in people over 50. Now, many people have called for lowering the screening age from 60 to 50 to help catch more cases early. Uh, this government actually pledged before the election to lower the age, so it will be interesting to see if they follow through. But despite bowel cancer largely being a disease of older adults, it's young people that have researchers concerned. Over the last few decades, the incidence rates of bowel cancer has increased for those under 50. In the year 2000, less than five in every 100,000 people under 50 were diagnosed with bowel, with bowel cancer. And, but this rate is forecast to climb to around 15 in 2040. And if we talk about people rather than rates, because it's people who will require treatment, in 2000, this was 124 people. In 2040, this will be 524 people. And these 524 people won't be eligible for free screening, even if the minimum age drops to 50. So raising awareness is the best way to prevent delays in diagnosing younger people. Bowel Cancer New Zealand's recent campaign, Never Too Young, is a great example of an organisation helping to educate people on what signs to look out for. So now that we know these forecasted incidence rates, we can see into the future, we need to understand what impact they will have on New Zealand's healthcare system. And the short answer is New Zealand's healthcare system will be significantly impacted because not only are bowel cancer rates rising in young people, but our population is aging. In 2000, 12% of people in New Zealand were aged over 65. In 2020, this rose to 15%. In 2040, this will climb to 23%. That's nearly a quarter of the population aged over 65. And remember I said that bowel cancer is largely a disease of older adults. Well, back in 2000, just over 2000 people were diagnosed with bowel cancer. In 2040, because of our aging population, this will be over 4,000 people. And the question is, can our already struggling health system handle this increase? How to manage this will be a huge challenge. There is already debate about the best way forward with our limited resources. And this issue will only likely become more urgent. Health systems must balance providing access to a colonoscopy for screening programs uh, without increasing the wait time for those at risk. Uh, those under 60 and not currently eligible for free screening must be made aware of bowel cancer symptoms and funding must be increased to cover the treat treatment costs for an aging population. It will require a concerted effort from, from our government, from healthcare providers, from researchers, and of course, from our communities. Bowel cancer will likely impact your life at some point, if not you directly, then someone you know. So I just told you a data story. I hope it helped raise your awareness of bowel cancer in New Zealand. For the rest of my talk, I'll show you how I put this all together. 
It all started with the initial question, how did COVID-19 impact bowel cancer screening in New Zealand? And this was purely driven by personal interest. The story became something that covered a lot more, uh, but this question helped start the process. When we look at what data storytelling is made up of, we can easily break it down into these three parts. So the data, the story, and the telling. And I'll step through each of these and just show you what they look like for the bowel cancer data story, starting with the data. To answer my initial question, I needed to compare 2019 and 2020 bowel cancer incidence rates to see if there was any difference. So I went to Te Whataura's cancer web tool. If you're interested in New Zealand health data, Te Whataura has several web tools uh, for all the data that it collects and they make it really easy to access that information. And as you can see from this data visual, 2019 and 2020 rates are the same. I could have stopped there. That information helped me answer my initial question. But I needed to gather more contextual information because I knew that I would be sharing this data. And that process starts by asking a few more questions. Firstly, why were 2019 and 2020 data measurements the same? And this was because of our healthcare system working hard to catch up on those delayed screening. Second question, what is this data not telling me? And this is really important to understand when you're analyzing data is what, what do you not know here? And in this case, if all incidents of bowel cancer were captured in these rates, I, I didn't know that. Thirdly, what did I learn from this data? I learned that New Zealand was able to mitigate some of the impact on the pandemic on our healthcare services because those two rates were the same. What could be done to improve the impact of New on New Zealanders? Uh, this is looking for a bit more context as to what happens next. Uh, expanding screening age ranges could help to capture some of those cases that would have gone undiagnosed. And lastly, what is the wider context? And this is always good to try and understand to provide that context to your audience. Uh, in this case, it would be good for you guys to understand exactly how many people are impacted by bowel cancer or diagnosed with bowel cancer. And also what is the current uh, age range in terms of screening? And the answers to these questions help me when I'm writing my data story. They provide me with context. And some of them, like uh, question two, also helped me expand on my initial scope. For example, I now want to know who could be missed from this data. And trying to understand this led me to a research paper published uh, just, just a month ago, uh, which added a new layer to my data story. And this paper looks at the incidence rates, but with a focus on early onset bowel cancer or those people diagnosed before age 50. And so my analytics process continues. I won't take you through any more of it, but remember when you're gathering your data to also collect your context. So by incorporating this practice of collecting context, you'll find yourself better placed for the next step which is writing your data story. So after I've gathered my information, it's time to organize it into a story structure. For this talk, I'm not going to go deep into narrative structure, but I'll show you what it looks like at a very high level for this particular data story. This is the written data story I told you, or close to it. I wrote this before I designed any of my slides. At a high level, it contains three acts. Act one sets the scene and explains how New Zealand mitigated the impact of COVID-19 on bowel cancer screening. Act two provides a twist by highlighting that young people who aren't eligible for screening are raising concerns. And act three ties the previous two acts together by focusing on the future. The three-act structure has been around for centuries. 
it uh, dates back to Aristotle. And today we can apply this to our data storytelling. For those wondering how the high level data story is fleshed out, there is also narrative structure in the detail. Uh, if you've read my book, you'll recognize these as nested narratives. I'm not going to talk any more about these today though. I write my data story before designing my visuals because this story will help me decide what visuals I even need to create. Because there are parts of this story that are best communicated using data visuals. And when I know what parts they are, I know what visuals I need to create. And these narrative snippets become my graph takeaways. For example, in the first line of Act 1, the takeaway I want to use a visual to communicate better is over 3,000 Kiwis are diagnosed with bowel cancer each year. So now I'm ready to think about how I'm going to tell or communicate my written data story. And not all data stories need to be shared using data visuals, but I figured for this kind of audience that they were appropriate. These are all the data visuals I use to tell this data story. I've also used non-data visuals, and I'll talk about these next. None of these charts are fancy or complex. I knew I'd be stepping you through this quite fast, and so I kept it simple. I also kept the colors simple. Some were in grayscale, others used red to draw attention. Remember, these visuals aren't the data story. Think of them as visual scenes that help to tell it. So let's zoom in and pick apart one of these data visuals. Like the rest of the data visuals, uh, I began all of them with the title. What part of my data story am I trying to communicate? That title dictated what data I visualized, what chart type I used, and where I added design contrast. And when you know what you want the audience to take away, designing the graph is easy. That's why the data story is so important. Otherwise, you'll spend ages trying to tweak your visuals, not realizing that you're, you're flying blind by not understanding your message. Designing data storytelling graphs can be beautifully simple. They'll have a takeaway title, they'll list the data metric they visualize, they might have some data context included as part of the visualization, but importantly, design contrast will help make the data described in the title stand out. And this helps people understand the graph quickly. And you can add design contrast in multiple ways. Here, I've just used the color value or how light or dark the bars are to highlight that bowel cancer data measurement because that's what my title describes. To complement my more traditional data visualization charts, I've also used what some would consider more emotive ways to tell my data story. I included photos of people, either as part of news articles or as part of the bowel cancer awareness campaign. I even used little graphically designed people to help really up that emotive factor. And I do this because we are all emotive beings. As much as you likely love data and data visualization, you respond differently to non-data visualization design elements. And depending on your audience, you might need to include more of these emotive design elements uh, than you do data visualizations. It all comes down to understanding your audience's communication preferences and what is the best way for them to understand your story. So that's the data storytelling process in a nutshell. Start with your question, gather your data and your context write your data story, and then as a last step, design your visuals. If you're interested in my data storytelling process, this is detailed in the Data Storytellers Handbook. Uh, you can even download the first chapter for free on my website, roguepenguin.co.nz. 
Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Sweet, thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat the question again. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Kat that oh no, you just you just had? No questions. I just had my hand up, but I don't know if it came up. But I just wanted to say that was a total masterclass. So thank you, Kat. <laughs> That was incredible, both the data sto storytelling, the way you told that story, and then when you broke it down and kind of let us look under the hood. I don't think I've ever seen that before. That was stunning. So, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think just, just to walk into that, especially sort of in business, like you, you usually just have like, I don't know, a a, a, a chart dumped on a PowerPoint and then somebody just says something about it sort of thing. Um, and I think that really shows sort of how how you can structure it differently to actually drive home whatever point you you want to make if it's if it's about business or something something more sort of more emotional to to you personally. Um, but you can still sort of involve people and, and highlight a, a, the point that you want to make by walking people through sort of what leads to it and 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 how do you come to a certain conclusion or a certain takeaway? Cool. There's a lot of people thanking you and uh, also for the tip for the for the Tifatora data sets. Um, cool. Um, then if there are no other questions, I mean you you can if you do have any questions, you can reach out to Ked or, or Tabata on, on LinkedIn or other socials um and through their websites um with that i'll just share my last couple of slides um, yeah cool so we had that slide um for those of you who might not know about that yet, <laughs> there will be Visit Melbourne. We organized Visit Sydney, a sort of a, a one and a half, two day conference in Sydney last year in October. Um, we'll do the same thing in Melbourne in October. Again, we sort of finalize all the logistics at the at the moment. Um, the date is end of October. Um, so something more detailed will come hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, but we expect to have sort of two to 250 attendees. Um, last year we had sort of 25 speakers, so it'll probably be around the same, uh, and it'll be close to two days, uh, a two day event. Um, that's the QR code. So you can sign up for the mailing list to get all the details. Um, and I think it was, it was really good last year. Um, so we hope to sort of improve on that, um, this year in Melbourne. Um, also for those of you who can't make a trip to Tableau Conference or, or, or other big events like that. Um, that's sort of a, a nice way to get a whole bunch of um, really knowledgeable speakers sharing their um, their experience and their knowledge with, with others. Um, then if you feel like working for Tableau, they currently have an open uh, account executive role uh, in New Zealand. Um, so that's for the, for the commercial business. Um, so I, I don't know how many of us would feel confident selling Tableau, but you might know somebody who is interested in, in a sales role. Um, so that that is that that is open uh, at the moment. I don't know for how long. Um, so feel free to, to check that out or forward that to anybody um, who you think could be interested. And then, so I have two of those, uh, which are uh, Kat's books, uh, and I'm happy to give those away. So what I did was I have all of the people who uh, who attended today in here. <coughs> I'll spin the wheel. Um, and uh, if, if your name comes up, please write in the chat that I know that you are here. If you're not here, then I'll spin the wheel again um, until we find somebody who is here. Um, so we'll start with the first one. And that is Charles, 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 is Charles here? Maybe not. Read wrong. Okay. 
Okay, then we remove Charles and spin once more. Banana, I saw her name earlier. Oh, wow. Yes, very good. Congratulations. So that is one book for you. Um, you. I'll be in touch afterwards to, to see how we, uh, how we ship that or hand it over. Um, and then I have a second one. Lauren, is Lauren still here? I saw her earlier. Yes, Lauren is also yay. Lauren is also here. Sweet. So Banana and Lauren, I'll be in touch with you, and we'll figure out how we um, how we hand over the books. Um, and then, lastly, just to finish things off, um, sort of the the usual bits and bobs. Um, if you can, like, if you can host an in person event in Auckland, please get in touch with me. Um, we're always looking for um, for companies that that use Tableau who are happy to sort of host us um, that we can have an event in, I don't know, an event space or a boardroom. Um, we can figure things out around catering and, and drinks. Like we don't need you to, to spend on that, um, but it's mostly just sort of to have a location where we can actually physically, physically come together. Um, if you want to present either in person or in Auckland or in those virtual events, uh, you or somebody in your team, somebody you know, please get in touch as well. Um, it's always, Quite cumbersome to to find people who um, who want to present. Um, so every time, like, or if you have anything to talk about, and it doesn't need to be like a huge. Um, here's our uh, two thousand people tableau rollout plan. Um, it can be as simple as here's a problem that I had last week, um, and this is how I solved it, or this is how I approached it. Well, here's a cool techniques that I found a technique that I found the other day, and I think others should know about as well. Um, and if you offer a job, so if you look for jobs, um, feel free to post in the um, in the Auckland Tableau User Group LinkedIn group. Um, there's also a New Zealand Tableau Users uh, LinkedIn group, uh, or get in touch directly. Um, and then sometimes I hear about things and I might be able to put you in touch as well. And lastly, oh, there. thank you to, to Tabata and Kat uh, for presenting, sharing sort of what they do and, and, um, and they are their experience and knowledge with us. Um, we do have another four minutes. If anybody came up with any other questions for Tabata or Kat, you can still ask them now. Um, And I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Cool. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you all for, for attending um, and hope to see you next time, whenever that might be. <coughs> Great session. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. Great session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are you still recording, Alex? Yeah. Oh.